With chapter 17, we are encountering one of the most infa infamous uh, figures in the history of psychology in Sigmund Freud. And it's very common uh, that uh, a lot of modern psychologists don't like to mention Freud very much because after all, what we understand from his work now is that it was highly non-scientific and had very little predictive value and the use of psychoanalysis as a therapeutic technique has for the most part fallen out of favor, favor uh, decades ago. But nevertheless, since this is a class about the history of psychology and also about significant theories in the history of psychology, it is important to talk about Freud because his theory is one of the most ambitious that have ever been proposed. And in particular, it's a theory that not only explains as it famously does, or attempts to explain as it famously does, the a nature of any kind of psychological disorders, neuroses that people possess, but it also is an attempt to explain all aspects of behavior, including uh, child development, not just personality development, but also uh, cognitive development, intellectual development, perceptual and motor development. All of these kinds of skills, all of these processes are driven, uh, as we shall see, by a dynamical approach, a psychodynamic approach, based on his idea of energy flows from the unconscious mind. So this idea of psychodynamics is at the root of his theory. Dynamics uh, as a field is the study of energy. And psychodynamics is the study of mental energy. And so the idea here is that the conscious mind and the unconscious mind are generated by a form of biological energy that is converted into what Freud calls psychical energy. And the uh, unconscious mind in particular is the reservoir of all of our psychical energy and it's associated with a variety of different instincts. And Freud's goal is to study how these processes within the unconscious mind work. So we could possibly compare what he's doing to Tishner. If you remember Tishner's idea of structuralist psychology, an attempt to break down the conscious mind into its basic elements or structure, Freud is doing a very similar thing now, but he's doing it for the unconscious mind as well. So let's start with the basics of his main theory. A newborn child is born with a primitive version of a personality containing just what, he, what Freud called the id. The id is part of the unconscious mind, and as I said already, the unconscious mind is the reservoir for all of our instinctual uh, needs and desires. So the id is the place where these instinctual re uh, desires reside. So the id is just basically a por portion of our personality that is a collection of all of our instinctual needs. And the id is the tool that these needs will use to try and achieve satisfaction. So the id works according to one principle. It's called the pleasure principle. And the pleasure principle is, is really the main goal of it, is to keep the mind at, in a quiet and calm state. And this is a state that is associated with low energy. So getting back to the psychodynamical idea, we don't want to have a state of high energy because this is a state of tension, of nervous tension, that is unpleasant. And so a pleasurable state is one where we can discharge this energy and return to the calm and quiet state. What causes energy levels to increase in the mind? And that is where the instinctual needs come in. If we have an instinctual need that, has ki that is kicking in and it is not being satisfied, this creates tension or frustration in the mind and this causes a buildup of energy. A good metaphor that I like to use here is to think about the id as a reservoir, a big lake that uh, is receiving um, input from smaller streams. So smaller streams and rivers uh, feed into this reservoir. Now each one of these streams is one of our instinctual needs. And so as 
these instinctual needs begin to kick in. Let's just talk about one very basic one, hunger. Uh, as it begins to kick in, as we get more and more hungry, the flow of water from that stream is going to flow very strongly into the reservoir and very quickly the reservoir is going to fill up. And so we need to do something to reduce this this tension from from over to prevent things from overflowing. And as a reservoir does, it's going to have a dam on one end that gives us a way of trying to discharge the energy. And the id, of course, uh, is hopefully going to be able to handle that. As we're going to see, it's not going to be able to handle that, and it's go we're going to end up having to create other layers of the personality to handle this frustration. But for now, let's just talk about the it. Working according to the pleasure principle, a newborn infant, this is all that there is uh, to their personality. And it's the basis of everything that the infant does. It's the basis not just of their voluntary behavior, but also even their involuntary behavior, such as their reflexes. One simple example is that if you were to shine a light into the child's eye, this, this light would cause excitation of the receptors in the, in the retina. This causes activity in the nervous system, and this builds up psychical energy. So this is an unpleasant state, and now the id is going to be motivated to, uh, according to the pleasure principle, to reduce that energy, and this triggers the blinking reflex. The child closes his or her eyes, and now the, uh, the nervous activity returns back to the calm and quiet state. So all behavior, as I mentioned earlier, voluntary, even involuntary reflexes are all governed at some level by the pleasure principle here. So let's take a look about this, look at this issue of frustration a little bit more. Recall that uh, as the levels of the reservoir begin to rise, we want to try and find a way to reduce that. And so this, this requires energy. So now we have mental energy that is going to be devoted to try and come up with a way of reducing this tension or this frustration. So what kinds of activities can a child do, can an infant do? to deal with some of these instinctual needs and desires that they're going to have. Let's take a look at one that all children obviously have, which is hunger. This is one of our instinctual needs. We know, for example, that with the blink, blink reflex mentioned earlier, that if the uh, once the energies begin to arise, then there's an involuntary reflex that can just automatically happen. And once it happens, the pleasure principle is achieved and the infant returns to its happy state. But the child does not have any reflexes that can bring food to them when they are hungry. There's nothing that they can do reflexively and voluntarily that's going to satisfy their hunger. They need someone else to feed them. So they have to develop the ability to have some sort of a uh, voluntary response rather than an involuntary response that's going to bring food. So. The chain of events here is that as the hunger kicks in, this is going to create initially some physical pain, the stomach contractions and so forth, which creates crying and restlessness. And as it happens, this crying and uh, activity of the child brings the attention of someone, a caregiver, a parent. And maybe they consider that the child might be hungry, so they bring a bottle of the breast for food. And the child then obviously uh, receives satisfaction receives uh, a reduction in the tension because now they have uh, received the food. But of course the child is going to learn about uh, the consequences of this sequence of events that whenever they cry in a particular way someone might bring them food. So this creates a several different kinds of, of activities now going on in the mind of the infant. First there is that learning process that I just described the child also learns about what it is that satisfies that feeling of hunger. Whether it's the bottle or the breast, the child begins to have a visual image of that thing and will begin to wish for and think about that thing whenever uh, he or she feels hungry again. So the idea here is that this instance of frustration, because the child experienced hunger and could not reflexively make that feeling go away, resulted in the development of some very early stages of cognitive processes, learning, psychological processes of memory and, and, and imaging, imagery, 
all of that stuff occurred because of frustration. If the child, imagine, if the child actually had a reflexive action to satisfy hunger, then none of that stuff would have ever happened. The child could have just initiated whatever reflex that uh, they had, and the hunger would have went away, and no actual development, no learning, would have ever occurred. So a very key point in Freud's theory is that frustration is crucial. Without frustration, we would never develop any of these uh, higher cognitive processes. We would simply remain in a primitive and infantile state of mind forever, because every time we had a need, that need could be reflexively and instantly met. What purpose would there be in developing any other uh, cognitive abilities? There wouldn't be. The whole purpose of all of these other cognitive processes is really because of frustration. Freud calls this the primary process, that when we have um, frustration occurring because our involuntary behaviors are not sufficient to achieve the pleasure principle, we develop voluntary behaviors. So the development of the mental image that satisfies the tension, so developing memories, memories of the things that satisfies the hunger, and of course learning about the consequences of our actions. That is all the primary process. There's some limitations, however, to this process because the id does not understand the difference between fantasy and reality. So the next time the child feels hunger, the child will again begin to fantasize about the food, about the thing that satisfied the hunger previously. And visualizing the image is the same as reality for the id because it doesn't understand the difference between fantasy and reality. So as long as the id is fantasizing and visualizing the food, it's the same as if it was really there. So it's trying to engage in wish fulfillment, basically. But as we would understand, that does not, in fact, satisfy the tension. It does not make the frustration uh, disappear. So this creates even more frustration. And gradually, the frustration just builds and builds, because even then, if the child begins to cry, sometimes that caregiver does not bring the thing that uh, the child is wishing for. So we end up now getting back to that metaphor of the reservoir of the id beginning to now overflow. We're trying to open up the floodgates to let out some of this energy through wish fulfillment, through fantasization, but it's not working. It's not enough to lower the levels that are now rising in this reservoir. It's about to overflow its banks. So what comes next? This is now the time where we have to create a new reservoir. It's a new layer to the personality, and it's called the ego. The ego now develops as a brand new reservoir, which is able to now handle the overflowing waters of the id. And the ego now works according to different principles. It works according to the reality principle, because the child is experiencing frustration now that even when they are crying and wishing for this thing, the care caregiver doesn't bring what it is they're wishing for. The next level of solution is to find a way to go get it for yourself. The id has no ability to deal with reality, so it could not go get things for itself, but the ego can. So this next layer of the personality is created that can understand reality. It learns and no it understands the difference between fantasy and reality. But of course, in order to be able to go out there into the world and get those things that the id wants, the ego needs to be able to operate the body. So motor development begins to occur. So now we are looking at infants who are, you know, a little bit older, four to six, seven, eight months old. They start to learn how to control their arms more smoothly and accurately, and they start to be able to sit up. They start to be able to crawl, ultimately even to walk. So all of these motor milestones are actually driven by what Freud is calling now the secondary process. The secondary process is the next level of cognitive development that occurs uh, because the ego is trying to satisfy the needs of the id by just going out there into the world to get those things that it wants. So motor development, but also perceptual development because one thing that we know about infants is that when they're born, their vision is not very well developed. It's very blurry and very dim. Uh, and they develop by the time they're close to about a year to a year and a half old, uh, fairly uh, almost adult level vision. 
Freud argues that the reason for this development is because as during the course of their motor development they also have to be able to see their surroundings to, to be able to navigate and find things. So it's all driven, again, by what the id wants. At this stage of development, the ego is nothing more than a slave to the id. The id is basically saying, I want what I want, I want it now, that's the pleasure principle. Uh, and uh, nobody is bringing it to me. So ego, you have to go out there and get it for me. And the ego causes the body to develop so that we can uh, interact with our surroundings and go find these things. We engage in reality testing of learning how to deal with uh, the real world, how to interact with it. But then, of course, as a child continues to uh, develop and move around its environment, it encounters another level of frustration. Because now uh, the child who is getting to be about a year and a half to two years old likes to get into things. It likes to explore its environment. It likes to start looking and climbing on things and so on and so forth. And then the parents are there to always say no. This is the time we might label as the terrible two, where the child is running and going around and getting into everything and climbing onto stuff and opening drawers and opening cabinets and checking everything out and looking for stuff and the parents are saying no, 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 you can't do that. The ego cannot deal with this right and wrong, yes and no command from the parents. This is now the child's first encounter with discipline. And the, and the ego is unable to deal with the concept of right and wrong, that some behaviors are actually morally wrong. The ego is only trying to satisfy the id, and it hasn't does not have the ability to understand that some of these things may be in fact immoral and should not be done. So this creates more frustration. So now this, this reservoir of the ego begins to overflow and it can't be contained. So now we have to create this third and final layer of the personality, a new reservoir to contain this excess energy. And it is the superego. And now the superego really is the assimilation of all of the parental moral dictates. So we have a list of morally good behaviors called the ego ideal. And we have a list of morally bad behaviors called the conscience. And so now, when the ego is receiving instructions from the id to say, this is what I want, go get it for me, before it can do that, it has to consult the superego. It has to consult the ego ideal and the conscience to make sure that it is not violating the rules of the superego. One thing very curious here is that the superego is part of the unconscious mind, as is the id, whereas the ego is more associated with the conscious mind. And part of the, as part of the unconscious mind, the superego is similar to the id in that it does not obey the reality principle, but it only understands fantasy. What that means is that the superego, whose job it is, is to reward and punish the ego. If the ego follows the dictates of the ego ideal, it gets rewarded. If it, if it uh, disobeys the conscience, then it gets punished by the superego. But it is not simply just in, uh, something that happens when the ego actively engages in one of these good or bad behaviors, but even for thinking the thoughts. Because remember, according to the fantasy principle, thinking about something and actually doing it are equivalent. And that's for, as far as the superego is concerned. Thinking a bad thought is the same thing as actually doing it. And so the ego. Be begins to be actively punished by the superego for even thinking about doing the wrong thing. And this creates a new emotion. It's an emotion called guilt, right? You feel guilty for even thinking about doing things that you're not supposed to do. As the child begins to really assimilate uh, these moral commands, they, they presumably don't even think about doing things the way they're not supposed to do them. So now, Imagine a situation where we have a child who, again, maybe feels hungry, and the id says, I want what I want, and I want it now. Hey, ego, go get it for me. The ego goes to get it, but the parents say, no, you're not allowed to do that. Maybe the child is trying to climb under the kitchen counter to get cookies that are up there, and the parents are saying, no, you're not allowed to have those. The superego is there to learn when it is okay to take those things and when it is not. Now let's say, for example, that this developing child decides to ignore the superego and 
climbs up under the counter, sneaks a cookie, and runs off somewhere. Now that he or she has violated uh, the conscience, what happens? Well, maybe the child has he or she is running to go uh, eat the cookie in a secret place so that they don't get caught. Maybe they're running out the back door. What happens? They drop it in the dirt. Or they trip and fall. Or maybe when they eat it, for whatever reason, it seems to just taste bad. All of these things, according to Freud, are not accidents. These are ways in which the superego punishes the ego for violating the conscience. There would be no such thing as an accident. Bad things that happen to us, getting, you know, getting hurt, tripping, uh, feeling sick, losing something, all of these things are things that the superego does to punish us for violating our conscience. On the other hand, if we do actually uh, go with the ego ideal and we only have the cookie when we're supposed to have the cookie, that's when the superego rewards us and allows us to be able to relax, to enjoy it. It will taste good um, in that way because we're being rewarded for following the rules. So this slide kind of summarizes the whole process of how the energy flows and I wanted to go back and go through this again so that we can see how it works. Again the idea is that we are born with all of these instincts, these sources of energy and I'm going to use that metaphor again that each one is sort of like a river or stream that feeds into the reservoir of the id. Each instinct has, as Freud called it, a source, an aim, an object, and an impetus. The source is the uh, bodily origination of the energy to begin with. So hunger, for example, has obvious bodily sources that reside from the, the digestive system and, and the bloodstream and so forth. The aim is to reduce the instinct. So in the case of hunger, again, we want to reduce the, the feelings of hunger. The object is whatever object it is that actually reduces the instinct, so in this case food. And the impetus would be its strength which can vary from very mild to very weak. And a good example of this with hunger is that, you know, if you think to any time perhaps when you were reading and studying for a class and it's maybe somewhat late at night and you start to get a little bit hungry, but you ignore that. You put it out of your mind because you have a lot of studying to do and you don't want to stop right now. So you keep on studying. But time passes and you get a little more hungry and a little more and a little more and pretty soon you can't even really concentrate anymore. All that you can think about is food. You can't even concentrate on your studying anymore. And it gets to the point where you have to actually stop and go eat. The idea here is that the impetus has gotten so strong that the energy has ri risen so much that you uh, can't put it aside anymore. You now become wholly preoccupied with satisfying that uh, desire, that instinct. So id is the reservoir, as I said, that is the source of all of these instincts. It is where all of these instinctual rivers feed into it. And it is now in charge of trying to satisfy them, to try and reduce these uh, instincts. One other thing that the id can engage in is called displacement, which is a way of trying to deal with some of this excess energy even when you can't satisfy them. So the idea is that sometimes engaging in metaphorically related behaviors can temporarily handle some of the energy. Uh, a, so a baby that is hungry may suck on their fingers or put toys in their mouth. The idea here is that you're engaging in some behaviors that have a relationship to the act of eating that would satisfy the uh, drive, but uh, it's obviously only temporary. And again, because we have this buildup of frustration, because the id cannot always handle all of that frustration, we end up creating the ego um, and ultimately the superego because the pleasure principle itself uh, by itself has failed and we need these extra processes, this, the primary and then later the secondary process so that we can have the reality principle, so that we can interact with reality and achieve the things that, that will satisfy our instinctual needs. One specific example of instinct in Freud's theory is the libido. Freud uh, theorized that there were several different 
instincts uh, that drive our behavior, but one that he's famous for focusing on is the libido, sometimes called the sex instinct or sex drive, but it's also associated with a creative force. And he argued that children will go through stages of psychosexual development where the libido is focusing on various parts of the body and motivating children to want to stimulate those parts of the body and these parts of body are, are called the erogenous zones and there are three of them the mouth, the anus, and the genitals. Children are born in stage one which is the oral stage so now uh, the libido is, is driving them to want to stimulate the mouth. They want to engage in various oral behaviors. Freud defined five modes of oral functioning taking in, holding on, biting, spitting out, and closing the mouth. And so the child would want to engage in all five of these uh, modes of oral functioning to satisfy the libido, to satisfy their needs. Now various things can happen here. The child could develop a fixation, that is they could de uh, learn that certain kinds of oral behaviors are so pleasurable that they do it over and over and over again. And this now creates a, a, a change into their personality because now that they learn that it's just so pleasurable to do this, maybe to Let's talk about the oral mode of taking in, for example. If they gr take such great pleasure in taking in, that maybe later in life they will now manifest the taking in mode in other aspects of their personality. So they may develop a, a love of learning, for example, because that is the, uh, an oral mode of functioning that they have a fixation on. On the other hand, they may develop a frustration. Maybe uh, parents are around or someone some for some reason a child is prevented from fully satisfying the need to take in and that could also perhaps result in the exact same adult level behavior that because a child was frustrated and was not allowed to take in enough during early infancy that they compensate for that as an adult by developing this strong love of learning because they are trying to make up for all of that frustration in early childhood this provides a good example of why Freud's theory is not scientific because we have in this case two different reasons why somebody would develop the exact same adult personality of a love of learning. Both of them are based on the oral mode of taking in, but for different reasons. One was a fixation, the other was a frustration. The next stage, stage two, is the anal stage. So now the stimulation from the libido moves from the mouth to the anus and the child is motivated to stimulate the anus which mainly occurs through defecation and this occurs when the child is close to two or three years old so this is also close to the time of toilet training and this is one of the first encounters a child has with an authority figure and the concept of discipline so this also coincides when this with when the superego is developing because one thing that the uh, the id is going to want from the libido here is that when if they want to stimulate the anus when they feel the need to move their bowels the idea is to just go right away right and a child wearing diapers it's not a problem but when parents are now trying to train their children to use the toilet and to not wear diapers uh, now they have to engage in something else they have to delay gratification and the id is not able to deal with that and neither is the ego so the super ego has to develop to develop that that self-discipline to be able to delay gratification and Freud argues that there are all these kinds of of um, problems that could go wrong if the perhaps if the toilet training is too strict and the child is overly punished for having accidents or not delaying gratification various things could happen so Freud defined that there could be a retaliation Retaliation is when the child uh, retaliates against the authority figures, and so now in their adult personality, they have no, uh, they don't really like authority figures, and they have no self-discipline, and it results in the uh, anal expulsive personality type, where they are someone who is always getting in trouble. They are always late for appointments. They are messy and sloppy. They're disorderly. They spend their money. They don't keep good track of their of their expenses, so they're always. Uh, messing up their their accounts and so forth and so that's the classic example of an anal expulsive personality on the other hand strict toilet training could also cause a reaction formation 
And when that happens, the child then uh, really fully incorporates that strong discipline into their personality and develop the anal retentive personality type where they become compulsively neat and frugal and always on time and punctual and so forth. So now we have a situation where the exact same behavior, the exact same incident in early childhood, overly strict toilet training, results in two completely opposite personality types. Again, we see um, how the lack of uh, you know, specific predictions here uh, it makes Freud's theory not scientific. One other interesting point to make is that it's, it's, if uh, rather than being strict with toilet training, some parents can be overly praising and pleading. And when the child successfully uh, uh, uses the toilet, then if the parents uh, really praise the child almost too much for that, then Freud argued then that the child may develop the idea that their product of what they have produced there has great value. They've developed the, uh, a personality characteristic associating with producing something or expelling something as having great value. So it might cause them to develop a generous or philanthropic, philanthropic personality as an adult. Giving things away has great value. Next up is the third stage, which is the phallic stage. When a child is getting close to about age four or five, maybe six. And this is when children begin to uh, understand the difference between the sexes. Boys and girls begin to realize that there are boys and girls, that they are different from each other. And they also begin to understand the anatomical reasons for why they are different from each other. And they understand it pretty much at the most obvious level, which is that boys have a penis and girls don't. That's what is obviously, obviously visible. And so the phallic stage is called the phallic stage because it is focused on that. It is focused on, on the penis. And because this is a, a sex-specific phase, boys and girls are going to go through it differently. The male phallic stage is characterized famously by the Oedipus complex, which is named after the Greek tragedy Oedipus Rex. And in that play, uh, the, the king... Um, receives a prophecy that he would be murdered by his own son and his son would take over his kingdom. So the king orders his son, Oedipus, to, to be uh, killed. But the king's servants don't have the heart to do it, so they send the child off into exile. And the child is raised uh, in another kingdom, far away. But as an adult, Oedipus visits the same oracle and receives the same prophecy that he is destined to kill his own father, wed his mother, and take over the kingdom. But believing that this refers to his parents who are unknown to him, his adopted parents, he leaves home. And in leaving home, he visits his original homeland where he encounters his real father, gets into an argument with him, kills him, marries the queen, who happens to be his real mother, and takes over the kingdom, fulfilling the prophecy. And as is typical of any tragedy, everything is revealed and everyone is now terribly upset and everyone dies. So, uh, but the idea, as, as uh, Freud concluded, is, is that this kind of a play represents something deeper about the human psyche. And it represents what's happening during the male phallic stage. So, during this stage of development, boys develop sexual feelings for their mothers. They want to possess their mother sexually, and they begin to view the father as a rival. So they don't like the father. They have these feelings of rivalry and hatred towards their father and sexual attraction to the mother. They also begin to feel a fear that because their father is a rival, that maybe they feel that their father will castrate them as punishment for these feelings. So in order to get through this stage, what the male child has to do is stop having those feelings for the mother and instead begin to identify with the father rather than fear the father. And then they begin to identify with their male uh, gender and proceed normally. The female stage is different and it is notoriously seen as a little bit sexist because here the focus again on the phallic stage for girls is that uh, they don't go through a stage where they develop sexual feelings for the opposite sex. Rather, what they do is that they notice um, that 
um, they uh, do not have a penis, although boys do. And they experience penis envy. They believe that they want one, or they, they in fact, may perhaps used to have one. And they blame their mother for the fact that they do not have a penis. It is almost as if maybe they think they used to have one, but were castrated by their mother to make them just like her, so that they would both would uh, be without one. This causes the female child to, to resent and hate her mother for that, and this is called the Electra Complex, based on another old Greek tragedy in which uh, a woman uh, was mad at her mother and, and ordered her to be murdered. So, again, in order for the female child to pass through the stage, she needs to stop feeling those feelings towards her mother and instead identify with her mother, identifying with her female gender so that she could then proceed with the normal uh, gender role development. During this stage, another thing that children do, because again it's the libido, and so the, the, the desire to um, stimulate the body parts uh, is, is still there, and so children engage in masturbatory play at this stage, where they explore uh, their parts and, 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 and just check them out and see what they do, begin to learn what they're all about. The next stage is called the latent stage, which, as I have here, is basically meaning that the libido goes underground. And so nothing is really happening in the middle childhood years from ages six or so up until puberty. The libido is not active, and so nothing really is going on until we get to puberty, which is now we entering into stage five and called the genital stage, which is what we uh, stay in when it comes to the psychosexual development throughout our sexually active years of adulthood. So going from adolescence to late adulthood, our behaviors related to the libido are all driven by the need to stimulate the genitals. And it is not the masturbatory sort of phallic stage kind of desires, but rather it is more for uh, sexual behaviors. So all of our behaviors that, that uh, relate to socializing with the opposite sex, dating, and marriage and having family, it is all driven by the desire of the libido to stimulate the genitals in sexual uh, uh, intercourse. So that pretty much wraps up what happens as one specific example of how instinct will affect behavior and drive behavior through, um, through the id.